Kitco News special coverage of Masari's annual Mainit Summit is brought to you by Oasis Pro. Hello, I'm Michelle McCory. Welcome back to Kitco's coverage of the Masari Mainnet Conference in New York City, where some of the world's top leaders in crypto, Web3, DeFi, and digital assets have gathered, including Chris Perkins, CEO of Point Fund. Chris, great to have you with us. Thanks, Michelle. Great to, have, great to be here. And a quick recap of your bio. Point Fund is an asset management firm focused on decentralized technologies. You're, of course, a Marine Corps vet, so thank you for your service. And you've recently been appointed by the CFTC to serve on the Global Markets Advisory Committee. So very, very knowledgeable on regulation. And prior to your entrance into the crypto world, you were a managing director at Citi prior That's to right. joining Coin Fund. Just to give our viewers a little bit of background. All right. So a lot of topics that we want to discuss with you, but let's kick off with the Caesar rate that you have launched along with Coindesk Indices, which stands for Composite Ether Staking Rate. And you're saying that this is a defining institutional reference rate for the crypto asset class that can really revolutionize the way we operate on Web3. It's a pretty big statement. So explain what is Caesar? Yeah, awesome question. So happy to be here. So I spent 15 years in traditional finance and a lot of my background was in the interest rate space. Interest rate markets are the largest markets in the world, particularly in the derivative space. It's a $500 trillion market. Uh, do you know the size of the interest rate swap market in crypto? It's zero. Uh, we don't have interest rates. We don't have native interest rates. Um, and if you think about how important interest rates are, they drive the entire global economy. I know you used to work at another organization. You turn on Bloomberg in the morning. All they talk about is what's the Fed going to do? Like, what's the Fed going to do? And interest rates drive economies. We talk a lot about the Fed here on uh, Kidco oh, right? as well. Of course. Um, but the issue that you have is that without interest rates in, in the crypto space, you're, you're depriving it of a lot of um, utility. And so... When Ethereum moved from proof of work, which was a way that they validate the network, to proof of stake, you know, some of us stepped back and were like, oh my God, we now have, for lack of a better word, a risk-free rate for Ethereum. Because every single day, those validators, and today there are about 500, sorry, 800,000 nodes that validate the system, they receive rewards. And if we're able to standardize those rewards, um, that essentially becomes a foundational benchmark rate. And then, okay, what would that look like in the crypto space? All right, today, uh, without rates, there are no benchmarks. Um, borrow and lend. You know, if you're gonna go get a mortgage today, right, um, you could get a floating rate. And typically, when you borrow, it's based on, a, on like a benchmark, right? So like, hey, I'm gonna have a benchmark prime, plus, prime, minus, whatever, but it's based on a benchmark. Um, there's none of that today in crypto. So if you're looking to borrow or lend, it's like, what's my rate? Well, it's whatever floating rate it is. Well, what is it? There's no transparency. And so that has hindered some adoption, okay? But as you start bringing in these things we call derivatives where I've spent my career and you base them on a standardized rate, you can also introduce new capabilities like fixed products where you swap fix for floating. And so the opportunity to just develop and compose around a standardized benchmark rate, you know, look at how many hundreds of trillions of dollars were underpinned by LIBOR, right? Yeah. There's zero underpinned by any benchmark in crypto because we don't have that rate. Now, LIBOR is a really interesting comparison because it has everything to do with the old world, right? Centrally controlled and opaque and manipulated. The beautiful thing about Web3 interest rates is that they can be perfectly observed on chain, right? So you can, you can actually look on chain and see those cash flows that are going out to those validators. And it's very transparent. It's very difficult to manipulate. Um, and I think if we can build social consensus around it, the amount of economic activity is essentially limitless. Okay. A lot to dissect there. Um, obviously, for our viewers, live or London interbank lending rates, uh, which had a lot of manipulation issues, as we've learned. And hence, I see your point about putting things on the blockchain eliminates some of that. 
But linking back to what you said about the Fed, right? I mean, the reason we watch the Fed at Kitco or Bloomberg or wherever you are is because it determines liquidity in terms of how people are able to access the funds. That is why it's relevant. So how would this rate Caesar based on ETH transactions, I believe, because you need to break that down for us, how it works exactly, be relevant for the crypto world? How does it determine liquidity? Great question. So let's talk about how, how this interest rate is composed first, okay? With proof of stake, those validators receive rewards every day. Those rewards are correlated to two primary inputs. The first is pretty simple. It's the number of validators. So the more validators that come on the system, they share in those rewards. Um, and so it comes down a little bit. If people leave, and I think in time, you're going to find this balance between, because I think the Ethereum staking rates like Caesar are going to compete with fiat rates. I'll get to that in a second. Um, but, but the first part of it is controlled by the number of validators. The second part of the, of the rate is controlled by activity in the ecosystem. And so this is fascinating because it's actually correlated to how busy Ethereum gets because when, and these are through, we call it priority transaction fees. And so if something is crazy that's happening in the ecosystem, and we saw our first example of this with the downfall of FTX, uh, people were like, oh my God, FTX is blowing up. I need to get and secure my assets on chain. I got to get them off that exchange. They were willing to pay up to prioritize their transactions. And so the fees spiked. The gas fees, as the they're known. The gas fees spiked, yeah. right? The second time we saw this, uh, this phenomena was with Silicon Valley Bank. Same thing, the world's blowing up, oh my gosh. And wouldn't you know it, the gas spikes, the, the, the index spiked. But the third one makes it really interesting. And nobody gets the third time we really saw material spike. In fact, the largest spike. And that was when we saw a meme coin called Pepe started trading like crazy. And people were racing to get their transactions on the chain and confirmed. The network got busy and, and the rate increased. Now, why, why is an interest rate of this nature so important? You know, Ethereum has real utility. People need that rate to be able to pay for their gas, right? And so at this, by having a standardized rate, it gives new market participants the ability to hedge that gas in certain instances, okay? And right now, as I talked about, I think in the future, this rate of return, and it's also a real rate of return, it's printing around 4%, right? Ethereum today is essentially a deflationary, call it a flat, uh, it's non-inflationary, okay? So when we generate an interest rate, it's a real rate of return. When you look at Ethereum's rate of return of around 4% against the real rate of traditional markets, like generally it outperforms because it's non-inflationary. So this rate can be used just like anything in traditional finance to underpin that that was that was you know based on SOFA or anything else. You can do the exact same thing in crypto lands. I call it the new staking economy. Um, and I think it's gonna be, and again, today, the number of products are zero. We think that's gonna change in the very, very near term. And I'm very excited to see the market evolve. Okay, just to simplify things for our viewers, when you say Ethereum is not inflationary, you're referring to the fact that they get burned. The, the, yeah, so, so it, it, there down. was something called EIP-1559, where um, what we do is we burn the base fee. And so what it allows you to do is it, it, it generally, depending on the activity, when you burn uh, some of the base fee after you do a transaction, it actually, um, in certain cases, reduces the overall supply. And so emissions come from new, new issuance, transaction fees, come from existing issuance. And when you burn base fees, um, generally it keeps Ethereum slightly deflationary as, as, as an so asset class. You're looking to see the level of transactions on the Ethereum blockchain to determine the rates. Like the more demand there is, the higher the gas fees, that would dictate the rate yeah? Pretty much, yeah. The more active and congested the network becomes, or the, the fact that people are paying incremental transaction fees to prioritize their transactions, yes, then the rate will go up. So, you know, there aren't too many uncorrelated interest rates out there. And when you step back and you're like, well, wait a second, this is correlated to activity in the Ethereum ecosystem. And gosh, we have this really interesting use case with Pepe. Maybe this is the start of something that's a little bit less correlated to traditional rates. And remember, Michelle, 
Ethereum is on the proof of stake for uh, consensus for Ethereum is, is only a year old. Yeah. And so we haven't even begun to, to conduct the research uh, on this rate. But, but initial indications show that it's super interesting. It has very interesting correlations or non-correlations. And the real, the real rate, the real yield rate is quite interesting. So how do you see this developing then? Well, how do you see financial products or the equivalent of financial products being developed off this? So I, I, as I see it already, and you're seeing one of the big interesting trends in crypto right now is the rise of this staking economy where you have institutions saying, hey, going out to traditional finance shops and saying, hey, come stake with me and I'm going to pay you a rate of return, right? Um, as that develops, um, a standard benchmark is needed so that they can use it as a reference for their actual performance. And then, of course, you know, I, I think there's going to be a pretty monstrous derivatives industry that, that emerges. And we're already talking to a number of market makers and they'll be able to provide swaps that allow people to hedge risk. It's going to be pretty awesome. The next thing I'll tell you is there's massive talk about an Ethereum ETF, right? Yeah. Everyone in the States is focusing on the Bitcoin ETF. It's going to be awesome. I'm pretty sure it's going to happen pretty soon. Um, but the thing about Bitcoin is it really doesn't have yield. It's a store of value, pretty much. Where now you have Ethereum, and I know a couple of companies that I'm familiar with applied for an ETF today. A spot ETF or a futures ETF? Because talking, we know yeah, let's talk, Kathy Wood has applied for a spot ETF, and several have applied for futures ETFs. That's right. So let's, let's unpack it. So anything that's denominated in ETH is not that exciting. What people really want is they want total return ETH, right? So if I buy, let's just talk about a spot ETF really quickly. I don't want it to just reflect the price of ETH. I want ETH plus staking, right? I want that return. And so a benchmark like Caesar allows you to, to benchmark that return. But before we get any further down for our viewers that are not familiar with the idea of staking and validating yeah. and proof of stake, just quickly explain that. Sure. So. On a blockchain, in order to um, create a block on a blockchain, and a blockchain is nothing more than a big ledger, right? It tracks title of who owns what, right? In order to create those blocks, there are different, we call consensus mechanisms to affect it. Bitcoin uses something called proof of work. And so what miners do is they work really hard to uh, solve these mathematic, these very difficult mathematical problems that consume some energy to form that block. Ethereum used to work like that, but it transitioned. And it transitioned to something called proof of stake, where instead of having to do that hard math problem, validators put their Ethereum at stake and they put it at risk so that if, it's, um, if they act nefariously, they get something called slash, their ETH is cut, right? And in return for staking their ETH, they get rewarded in those two forms of, of, of revenue by emissions from the protocol and also transaction fees. And so what we did was we captured those cash flows. We looked at the mean across all the eligible validators um, within, our, within our methodology. And that became you know, the quote unquote risk-free rate of Ethereum, maybe more like a silver. Right, okay. So back to the e ETF. And you're saying the excitement is on a total return, ETH ETF, yeah. not spot, not futures. Break that down. So again, if you're holding on to Ethereum, it's great, right? It's going to move with the market up or down, depending on supply and demand. But truly, if you're holding Ethereum for any period of time, what you want to do is you want to stake it and you want to give it to one of those validators so that you receive those rewards, right? And so if I buy an ETF and I'm going to, for any period of time that I have it, I'm really hoping that it's generating that yield because Ethereum is a yield bearing asset. So. Sure, are people gonna be interested in an Ethereum product? Of course, but wouldn't you rather have something that paid Ethereum itself plus interest? Absolutely. So who is currently filing for this ETF? Nobody, uh, it's a holy grail and people are trying to figure it out. And so um, hopefully, you know, our index has been in the wild, or I'm sorry, our, our rate has been in the wild for a few weeks now. I think it's gonna be a core component, whether through physical, or even through synthetic via like derivatives as you spoke, to be able to structure products that reference this return, um, this total return product. But back to the more traditional ETFs, we do know that several uh, 
big players have filed for a futures e the ETF. I think mean, Grayscale just filed for one, Bitwise, Vanek, ProShares, they're, they're all in the market for a futures e ETF. Do you see that being approved? I, absolutely. You do? I, I, I do. I, I think that there's, um, we're moving very quickly on a road to um, clarity from a regulatory perspective. Um, I think it's very clear that Ethereum is a commodity. And I think the regulatory, um, the regulatory outlook is, is very clear. And so I, I think it makes total sense to have an ETF. I think it'll be approved. I think the Bitcoin spot ETF is going to be approved very soon. Um, you know, we just went through a court case where it was determined that spot correlations with future correlations are like over 99%. So I, I think those, both those products are going to be uh, out in the wild uh, fairly soon. Okay, before we get into the spot Bitcoin ETF, which of course our viewers want to know about, why are you so convinced that ETH is going to be classified as a commodity? Because there has been some, some murkiness there. Because we've had futures on it for a very, very, very long time. And um, it's, as, as I read the Howey test, it's very clear to me that Ethereum is sufficiently decentralized and meets you know, the smell test of being a commodity. Plus, we've had, we've had futures on it as a commodity for years and years and years. So there's incredible precedent around it. Um, so it's pretty obvious to me. Do you expect any kind of uh, formal ruling or definition of that in the, in the near term? No, but it would be nice. I, I mean, I, I don't think one is needed, to be honest with you. Um, the process um, is going to be very clear. Well, it's, it isn't irrelevant in terms of who gets oversight over it? Well, I think it's clear already, right? The CFTC is already exercising oversight on the derivatives, so they regulate the derivatives. So we've been, we've been operating in that capacity. It would be a pretty monumental change to introduce this concept of morphing, where something goes from a, a commodity to a security. That would be very novel. Um, and look, we're big fans at CoinFund of working closely with policymakers, especially the Congress, to really clarify a lot of these issues, which are nuanced. But for now, it's pretty clear to me that Ethereum has been a commodity. And you know, unless something changes, which we've never seen before, it'll continue to be one. How soon do you expect to see uh, ETH Futures ETF being approved? Because I believe there's an upcoming deadline for October where one... Yeah, I, I don't check the timelines that closely, but I, I don't think it's going to be... I, I don't see the controversy here that much. Uh, and hopefully it happens pretty soon. What impact would that have on the price of ETH? So I think that ETFs are awesome um, for, for price action um, because it solves for something that we struggle with in crypto land. Um, it abstracts all the operations, right? So if you're gonna, if you're gonna go buy Ethereum today, um, and you know, do you set up a wallet? Do you have like, you know, you have to write down all these passcode phrases, keywords. It's very difficult operationally. So the irony is, is like a lot of these commodities by turning them into securities, it fits really neatly into people and institutions' operational framework, right? They have all the operational capabilities in the world to handle securities. So this is just another security, right? And so I think it'll, 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 it'll eliminate some of that friction to get ac access to a really exciting asset class. Yeah. And so I think it's gonna drive demand. Now, getting back to Caesar, it's the exact same thing. It's just another interest rate. There's nothing unique. You don't need to set up a wallet or a unique custodian. So I find that scale is going to come to the crypto space when you take away and you abstract away all that operational friction, because my sense is that there's there's pretty strong demand out in the world around exposure to these very unique uh, and evolving asset classes. What impact would any of these ETFs have on the Caesar rate on the ETH side? It's a very good question. Um, so. Again, the Caesar rate is correlated to activity in the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, if people start buying Ethereum and using it more often, then the rate would tend to go up. Um, so it, it's correlated to activity. Yeah. And I think it would probably be positive for, for the, the output of that rate. But there's also a number of things at play. Does it make more validators get interested in the asset class? I think over time, the thing to think about is that an Ethereum staking rate is going to be competing with its traditional fiat peers. If you have a, if you have cost of capital, do you deploy it into Ethereum and take advantage of its real yield, or do you deploy it into a, a, a currency or a treasury and, and and benefit from that nominal yield? And of course, there's underlying correlations as well. But I, I see it as just another interest rate exposure that you can seek to to achieve. 
Okay, so should the seizure rate take off, safe to assume that the underlying asset ETH should appreciate significantly in price? There, there could be some correlation there um, if, if activity builds in, in the system for sure. And what is the likelihood of a spot e ETF being approved? We know that Kathy Woods, ARK Investors, just filed for one. Do you see that happening before a spot Bitcoin ETF? No, no. I, Ethereum will always come after Bitcoin for sure. Um, but again, what I think is even more interesting than a spot Bitcoin ETF is a total return ETH yes. Bitcoin. Yes, yes. Yeah. But, but, but for the viewers who are interested in yeah. number go up, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, if we get a spot uh, futures, uh, sorry, an ETH futures ETF, yeah. that would push up the price of ETH, one would think. Possibly, sure. Yeah. Of, and and the vice versa for a spot uh, ETF. Yeah, can you, you see can that? see people getting more interested in the asset class, but you know you can also short futures as well. So I don't I don't think it's a clear argument that yeah, but but generally speaking, um, as ETFs become approved, it's very positive to the asset class because it it provides a much easier access. Point. Do you have any forecasts for where you see the price of ETH? I know you're smiling at me, but our viewers want these questions answered. Uh, I think it's going to, yeah. What I are we at? We're like around uh, a, a thousand now, well off the 4,890 high. So uh, do you see us getting that back to that all time high? I, I, I'm a very big believer, like we're long-term investors, so I, I don't give price predictions. However, um, the more, the easier you make it to act the easier you make it for new money to come to the, into the space, right. and ETFs are a perfect example of that, it's very positive for the for the long-term outlook of the asset class from a price perspective. Okay, well, I'll take that as a general yes then. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's focus on the spot Bitcoin ETF sure. because you seem to have tremendous conviction that this is a done deal. Yeah. Why? Um, I don't think, I've, I, I, I know traditional finance and I, and I think when BlackRock jumps into the, into the mix, um, they tend to have their act together. And my sense is that that when that happened, I said, you know what? I feel like it's probably time for this to happen. You, you look at the DCG um, recent court case as well. And I think you're seeing a number of different things come together that make it look very positive um, to see that approval come in the near term. That's my personal perspective. And you're advising on the regulatory front. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I'm on the Global Markets Advisory Committee of the CFTC. And in that capacity, um, they've asked me to look into a couple of different um, assets to put forth regulatory recommendations. Specifically, they've asked me to look at NFTs and utility tokens. Um, but I'm also very focused on DeFi and also um, governance tokens. And literally, the uh, CFTC recently sanctioned a number of DeFi protocols. Um, and so I'm we're going to be working very closely with them to, to try to introduce a lot of nuance and focus on principles as they start thinking about their path going forward. But being on this committee, different from the SEC, but does it give you perhaps any insights into the likelihood or the inner workings of the SEC in the sense that they're both governmental agencies? Uh, when, when you say you're pretty convinced that a spot Bitcoin ETF is going to be approved, is that solely based on the fact that BlackRock which has a near perfect track record of ETF approvals has jumped in, or because you're sensing a shift in the regulatory environment at large? Both, both. Uh, I think BlackRock has a huge part of it, but as I go to DC, the narrative that I see is around, I mean, you know, and also in courts, right? We're getting a lot of clarity in courts and like math is math. And when we see correlations of 99% correlation of price action futures to spot, it's very hard to um, to not to ignore the truth when the data is so strongly supportive that there's not too much difference. If the concern is is uh, fraud and manipulation, and the numbers are saying otherwise, then I think I think data will prevail. And your data is signaling a spot Bitcoin ETF approved by early 2024. I think that's right. I think that's right. And because I have to go there, what do you think that would mean for the price of Bitcoin? I think it's going to be positive for the asset class. And we also have the halving happening in That's April. That's right. That's right. The halving is between the halving and... and I fixed up my accent there for yeah, a second. Yeah, I did. I was like, <laughs> you got me. Some people call it the halving. Like, anyway, uh, I think those are very positive, positive market inputs for, for, uh, for that asset class, for sure. So, again, to put you on the spot, because that's what I like to do, do you see 
Bitcoin reaching its all time high by the end of 2024? Yeah, it's hard to predict outcomes. Like, you know, the price is impacted by a number of macroeconomic factors, but like that is going to be a, those two factors that you state will be very positive for the asset class. Uh, I don't know, you know, does it, does it exceed its all time high? Look, we're, in, we're believers in the long term uh, yeah. performance of this asset class. We're very bullish. Um, and, and these are going to be two important steps to broader mainstream adoption. And overall, you are sensing that there will be regulatory clarity coming yeah. in the U.S. Because so, obviously that's been holding the space back dramatically. Yeah, we're going to get it one way or the other. And right now, recently, we've been getting it in the courts. So we had the Ripple decision that yeah. gave us some clarity. We had the DCG decision that gave us some clarity. We're seeing interesting case law develop in with, the, with, with civil cases as well. We've got the Coinbase uh, case lurking as well. All of these are really important steps on the road to clarity. And in the absence of that, like we also have like a number of different bills making their way through Congress. Again, when you look at the divide in Congress, it's really not partisan if you step back. It's generational. And, and when you look at it through that lens, it again makes you pretty bullish on the medium term outlook uh, of the asset class. Yeah, we have had a couple of conversations and it does seem to be that crypto, Bitcoin is one of those issues that does have bipartisan support. Yeah. One of the few issues in this very politically toxic, divisive landscape that has Sorry. a bipartisan support. Wrapping up this part of the conversation, going back to Caesar, what kind of interest are you seeing in this? Are you seeing institutional players start to inquire? Where is the interest level for this and what would be the next step? Yeah, we're seeing interest everywhere. We're seeing it from large banks that we're onboarding, research departments that are saying, gosh, this is a really interesting mac macro economic output. How busy is the theory? This is really cool. So everything from big major banks to market makers that are creating a forward curve to trade the asset class, to buy side, to people that are trying to structure products, um, crypto native and traditional alike. Um, it could even be interesting from a bank perspective, it's just another interest rate. So is it a synthetic way to get access to the asset class? And we're seeing really strong client demand. And the last thing I'll say is that I talked about that holy grail of total return ETH. This is going to play a key role in developing that in a transparent manner. So, yeah, massive demand and we're excited about it. Where do you see this, if all goes to plan, in five years' time? How do you see it integrated into the crypto Web3 economy? 100%. So, again... And I'm throwing out five years because it seems like a... No, reason. I, I, it's a reasonable time frame. Like I said, the interest rate swap market is a $500 trillion market, right? And it's zero in crypto right now. And, and that's just one asset class. We've got futures, we've got loans, we've got borrows. So like, I think in five years, you could see trillions of dollars in Notional emerge uh, re you know, with, a new re re with a new reference rate um, that's global, right? Other interest rates are regional, Sonia, Ionia, but this is a truly global observable interest rate. I can talk to the folks in Asia, Latin America, Africa. It's the same Ethereum staking rate, and that's very powerful. Very powerful, indeed. Kitco News special coverage of Masari's annual Mainit Summit is brought to you by Oasis Pro.